All right, <clears throat> we've actually got six packages to go through, but we're beginning with this big one. Let's see if that's enough. Sorry, I'm just wondering what, that, what in the world I even got here. Okay. I'm still not entirely sure, but I do remember getting it. It just looks very different than what I expected. <clears throat> excuse me. <clears throat> excuse me, excuse me. Mm, what is this? Okay. I'm just trying to make sure it's not like a really pornographic thing. It'd be better if I don't have to edit the video too much. So it's been a little bit delayed, so it's nice to see that it's finally here. High priority to have. I did obviously already watch it on Crunchy Munchy, but uh, glad to finally have the physical copy. This is sticky. That's interesting to note. Wait a second. Oh, yeah, this one's hentai, but that's. I think that was good. absolutely not for children yet. But fortunately, it's not so bad that it can be shown on camera, I guess. Now, I'm probably not going to dig into it until I know for certain that it's safe to show, but, uh, <laughs> show that. <clears throat> okay, that's a lot of packaging for a pile that's. More moderate in size, but yeah, so we got a hentai, uh, Shinobi Seduction. Uh, yeah. <clears throat> I think the back is kind of okay to show. But uh, yeah, this is uh, from uh, Kid Media, so Media Blasters. Um, and also before we get into this, we have, of course, Pokemon... Scarlet and Violet. I did buy the two individual editions. I wasn't able to get the combined one, even though I thought I checked relatively early, but eh. It's okay. This is a Bleach 4 film collection. I do have all of these films already on DVD, but some of them I did not think I had on Blu-ray. Unless it was another 4 film collection, but I could not remember, and my searches did not reveal anything, so here we are. I do believe this is a two disc whoa, two disc set. Sorry, and it's really weird because my hair is like <clears throat> decided to cling onto the handle of the um, thing. But yeah, two Blu rays. A strange thing, but it's here now. If I did have these before, oh well, cool, I've got doubles. Next up we have Given. Uh, one of these is a movie, and that would probably the one there that says the movie and this one the animation episodes 1 through 11 so presumably the hmm, different underneath the slip cover and I'm pretty sure I don't have these already the names don't ring a bell the given name haha <laughs> I see a regions A and B. There's an English stuff. Yes. They're taking the spotlight. Two discs. <clears throat> and then we got the movie. Given the movie. Mm -hmm. Take a look on the inside. Look at the back. 
That's a region A, B that looks like another English dub. Probably a little bit easier to see without the printing on the plastic. But it was still pretty obvious taking a look at it. Includes the new English dub. Did I get this before without English dub? If so, then it's a good thing I got it. So I do like to rebuy a series that was previously subtitled only but released up, but I don't remember one. Well, that's given. Uh, this one was, of course, important. Miss Kobayashi's Dragon Maid S, Season 2. Blu-ray. <clears throat> Another Dragon's at the Door. Regions A and B, English dub. Not that I can tell you anything about the English dub. Oh, different underneath the slipcover. Because, like I told uh, y'all, okay, I think I can just use this. Just gotta be careful. Like I mentioned a billion years ago, Miss, Dra Miss Kobayashi's Dragon Maid, I've avoided the English dub for because the characters were just too strong of a thing, and I kind of got the impression I should stick with the original Japanese with English subtitles that drove the world mad. And of course, you know, there's a reverse to that that I will talk about later. I already looked at the back of all this stuff. Let's look at the inside. That's this card. Okay, I was going to say, this only seems to have our main dragons, but there, there's the new one there whose name I forget. I'm blanking on most of their names right now. They're all pretty good characters, though. It's a great series. If you've not seen it and you've not heard me talk about it, I would say it's worth a watch. It's a lot more heartwarming and clever with its um, comedy. So if you didn't know, yeah, it's, it's, it's a good show. Very creative. Next, we have Fruits Basket Prelude. From the past to the future. Uh, that's a region A and B, an English dub. Presumably, I finished collecting the series. I'm blanking right now. I think you're right behind me if I have or have not. In fact, I wonder if this should be going in the bigger box with the other stuff. Basket another. Volume 1 through 3 available now. Something. Hmm. It's pretty stuff. And you know what? Since I brought up the question, here's, here's the box set. That does not look very complete. I suspect this fits in there just like so. Hmm. Was I supposed to do that? I don't know. Let's set this to the side. Take a look. We got Gundam Build Fighter Re Rise. Down there, I see a region A only. Um, sure I don't already have this. Sometimes it's really hard to keep track of what I do and do not have. Huh. 
And then last but not least, we have Lord El Meloy 2's case files. Okay, yeah, I don't think it was in a container like that, but I do recall it being a special case. Okay, so we can take that, put it aside. Take a peek at the inside. This is special. Grey's not special. Well, that's the Blu-ray, and this... Yeah, it's pretty thin, but, you know, kind of neat. Good artwork in it. Not sure if there's much I know how to read. Alright. Here's this week's anime Blu-ray collection update. Alright, there's been a b bunch of crazy stuff this week. But let, let's begin with anime. Um, Spy Family Episode 20. Definitely a better... I mean, the last one is, again, last week's thing where I had the issue with um, the f one half story being the kind of story that's just like I would call it a stinker because it's leaning so heavily on a joke that I feel you can't execute right and that one didn't execute right and whatever. Um, you know, this week's was better. Now, what exactly happened? That was fun. What was the other half of it? I'm blanking on what the other half of it was. Huh. But I thought uh, this week's was pretty entertaining. I think still more not entirely um, relevant to the story just yet. But maybe starting to have little hints of things that are slightly more important, I would guess. Um, Beast Tamer, Episode 8... It kind of is. Um, what exactly happened in it? I'm trying to remember. I guess they set up some stuff. It's moving forward. It's continued to being an okay anime. Um, nothing that I would look at and say, oh yes, this is awesome stand-up. Other than, you know, it's kind of got nice characters. Hmm. I'm the villainess, so I'm taming the final boss, episode 9. So I was admittedly slowed down. And I'm not telling these in the order that I've watched them. This one I literally just finished an hour or two ago. And only finished it because I had finally been... So, obviously, Pokemon's been a big distraction. Dead by Daylight's been a big distraction. But, you set those aside. I wasn't quite sure where they're going with episode 9. And I can't say that I completely feel great with where it's gone. Not that I feel like they had to do it a different way or anything like that. Just more like... I don't know. It's not as bad as The Walking Dead, but, you know, I never finished watching The Walking Dead because after a certain point, I just felt beat down continuing to try to watch this sh series, I guess. Even though it had its awesome moments, something about it was just like... I don't know. Like a feeling of a struggle that's going to go on for eternity and just it feeling exhausting. And I'm the Villainous felt sort of like it was maybe close to leaning in that. It's not exactly per se from an objective standpoint. This is, I think, just more my own. Something about it is tiring me a little bit. And not enough for me to say, oh, I don't want to watch it, but enough for me to say, maybe I want to play Pokemon instead of watching it. Uh, Bakshi the Rock, episode 7? Actually, it was a pretty funny episode, I thought. Um, again, leaning much more strongly into the idea that it's really about an introvert and her problem adjusting, and it plays off that stuff pretty fun. I I think we've seen Bakshi's family um, a good amount, but this is the first time where we've kind of gotten something I would say it feels like a more genuine interaction and some of the jokes are jokes that I think are not unexpected but they're executed pleasantly I, I guess like they're, they're just kind of amusing and so I th I'd say that was a good episode Chainsaw Man episode 6 um, you know it's continuing in this weird territory where it's like 
feeling a little more like Demon Slayer rules than what would been established as Chainsaw Man rules, but I don't know that the rules of Chainsaw Man had been really that well identified. This one does make a couple characters seem kind of eh, and I think maybe they're supposed to be. So we'll have to see what happens after Episode 6, because Episode 6 seems to be a deliberate slow build up to Episode 7, I suppose. I'll have to see episode 7 to find out. Uh, to Your Eternity, season 2, episode 3. Um, it's kind of gone in an interesting, unexpected d direction. This sh I, I think I commented last time that I appreciate the fact that the show does not feel like it's retreading grounds. Like, if there's one problem with it, it's that it's hard to tell that there's a feeling of going forward with it. Like, when I bench-watched the entire first season, I just kind of remember it feeling like it goes moment to moment, not like it's building up to something. And I guess that's really important compared to something else. But, um, you know, that's to your turn. You see, episode three actually taking some interesting and continuing to be engaging, even though some of the stuff that I thought was maybe about to happen in the show, I'm like, I'm not sure if I'll care too much about this. Will it feel right? And so far, it's actually felt surprisingly interesting and refreshing. The show really does a good job of feeling like it's still the same show, but kind of moving forward without even telling what forward necessarily is. Um, Irina the Vampire Cosmonaut, I actually only got to watch episode four. Um, and the three main reasons for that are, you know, Dead by Daylight, Pokemon, and... Um, Another anime series I'm going to talk about a bit, but uh, do I have anything to specifically say about episode four? Uh, I try to remember what specifically happened in it because it, I know I think I watched it earlier in this past week as opposed to later. And right now I'm not sure what was episode three and what was episode four, but I thought it was neat. I did want to see more of it. It looks like it kind of might be building up to something that's just very satisfactory to watch, possibly. But I, I'm not sure, and I don't want to speculate spoiler stuff too much, other than just, you know, kind of talk about my general feelings. But, unfortunately, I don't remember specifically Episode 4. I just remember Episode 3. I think you have a good idea if you're going to maybe want to continue watching it. I think I might have said that. Uh, reincarnated this is... Uh, Reincarnated as a Sword, Episode 7. Um, I'm still not sure how to feel about that. But it was definitely a bit of a twist. It felt like we learned more and got introduced to more stuff. Um, <sighs> okay. I think it was ending on that note. And it should be interesting to see where it goes from there. But the interaction with the character that they int they introduced at the previous at the end of the previous episode was surprisingly entertaining, even though they looked like an intolerable son of a bitch. But uh, I think that was the general goal, and because it knew that, and because it kind of had a plan for how it was going to play with that, it's been entertaining and interesting, if not making me kind of worried about if this is the way things ought to be or something like that. But, you know, continuing to enjoy it, continuing to look forward to it. Um, and then, the big anime thing I actually watched this past week is uh, Main Abyss, The Golden City of the Scorching Sun, which I do believe is classified as Season 2, which would make sense, because you had Season 1, then you had Movies 1, 2, and 3, with Movies 1 2 being a retelling of Season 1, and Movie 3 being the thing that's the actual sequel to the Season 1 we had before, and then Season 2 is a sequel to the Movie 3, but it's the second season. We all keep track of that? Okay, it's just... Made in Abyss Season 2, with a movie in between the seasons. Alright. And I'd say it was definitely pretty good. Um, strange as fucking hell. But somehow within the spirit of some of the weirdness that started being introduced into the series. And if there was any complaint I had about all of it. It would actually just be that it's hard to tell watching this season 
if you get a concrete feeling like there is some sort of meaning to it. You know, th that's kind of one of those tricky things. Um, if you've ever heard of a J.J. Abrams mystery box, one of the main complaints about it is if your mystery box is just a mystery box, then you kind of go and do that thing I was talking about where you kind of tire the audience, where they kind of are like, I thought you were about to give me something unexpected, but all you've done is say, oh, well, let's pretend there's something unexpected. And some shows are really funny with the way they execute things like that, but to actually do that is tricky and not necessarily going to work. Like, I completely gave up on Lost because I kind of felt like it was all mystery boxes with no meaning. And at that point, it's just like, why? And I think part of the problem is some of the people did guess some of the meanings, but then they decided they had to change it because people had majorly guessed it, I guess, which only just made it nonsensical as far as I'm concerned. But it still comes back to the fact that, you know, any interest I had in Lost waned when I felt like it would be too exhausting to continue to be interested in it. And that one is a problem of that show just having a continuous series of mystery boxes and no real resolution or answer, so to speak, as far as I could feel. And um, Made in Abyss doesn't feel like it's there yet, but this entire season takes place in a more stagnant way than the first season did and the first, or rather the third movie, Although the third movie being a movie was understood to be a singular story arc, so it's strange and it's hard to tell. Do I get a good feeling of all the feeling going through this? And I don't know. I just know that there's something about it that feels consistent and it's messed up as fucking hell in a very strange and interesting and ultimately at the end of the season a cathartic sort of way. Um, I really liked the characters. Like, I wasn't sure what I would think about them. But then, um, it did a pretty good job of just saying, okay, yeah, um, these characters are all kind of interesting. I... It's... It has an antagonist. So, antagonism is an important part of telling a story. And there are definitely... <sighs> What did I just say? Antagonists or having confrontation. Conflict is important. And usually this is from the point of view of protagonist, antagonist. And there's definitely antagonistic forces involved here, which isn't to say that there aren't antagonistic individuals, but rather the individuals who are antagonistic in this regard are also supportive. And it's interesting because it's a delicate balance that could very easily not work. But in the end, it feels right. Maybe partially because in Made in Abyss, the true um, antagonist is the Abyss itself. And I, I, I was going to say, and it's mystery and it's perils, but I think those don't even completely encompass everything about it that makes it the true antagonist. It's a real force of nature that it defies our understanding. And even though there's some explanations for certain elements of it and how to deal with and handle some of them at the end the abyss is still this very mysterious thing and I almost can't help but feel like maybe part of what makes the second season work is part of what made is kind of this feeling that would have been present in the first season that's it feels like the abyss itself is working against the characters. And mm, I don't know that me saying it exactly that way perfectly encapsulates the feeling of the show as a whole. But it's definitely the right idea. It's kind of reminded me a little bit of the first Silent Hill game where um, one of the things that made the very first Silent Hill game very entertaining and stand out compared to the other Silent Hills, including Silent Hill 2. And, and this is, you know, I found the first Silent Hill to be 
scarier whereas Silent Hill 2 is just this more beautiful piece of art. But if I wanted a scarier one, the first one would have been the one I would point to. And part of it is when you play through Silent Hill 1, you feel like the town itself hates you. And I don't mean like the buildings or the people or... It's this abstract concept of the town itself somehow hates you. It somehow is out to get you. And well, that one definitely feels a lot more horror experience. You're being... You, you're, the stuff of your nightmares being come true, whereas um, there's something very different about the way the Maiden Abyss, Abyss is feeling. But yeah, overall, I really enjoyed the second season. Um, at least my level of disturb for it... Hmm, I, I guess I, I'm just trying to think if I can say that without it being spoiler, but I don't think I can. So let's just say I did have a dream that was definitely somewhat inspired by one of the concepts I took away from it, but it wasn't... Um, a specific idea from it so much as a kind of slice of one of the general ideas of one of the things it sort of had. Um, and I'm trying to remember if I can remember the dream well enough to even remember because it wasn't any of that thing. It was sort of like being cursed but while other people were suffering from the curse I was spared from the curse because I just had to do a couple of things to alleviate my transgressions or something like that. And that's not exactly anything that's from Season 2, but there are elements of that where if you've seen Season 2, you might kind of understand um, some of that. And really, it was just that generic. It wasn't even a specific thing there, but when I woke up afterwards, I'm like, oh yeah, it was inspired by that kind of overarching idea. Inspired by being a keyword. So... And overall, actually, that was a great thing this past week. And the reason the timing for that happened the way it did is because Wednesday is when the um, last episode was finally Englished up. The English dub of the last episode finally came out. So I'm, I've am i got a couple series that I am keeping an eye on just to kind of make sure I get the timing of some of that stuff right. So, for example, I think next week is when Uncle From Another World resumes, or at least the new episodes that haven't aired yet. I should probably double-check that on Netflix but, um, definitely curious to continue that one a bit. That one went on a little bit of a hiatus. But again, it's supposed to come back, as from what I could tell from the reading. Um, I guess before I get too far away from things that I've watched, um, there was something I was talking about. I, I don't remember. So, with um, my Twitch friend, um, we watched Aliens, and I chose the director's cut for them to watch, and uh, Predator, the, you know, the two 1980 action movies. I think Predator was 1980. It'd be pretty damn impressive if it was 1970. Um, hmm. I was trying to think if I would make any comment if it was 1990. It'd still be a good movie. I mean, it was a good movie, in my opinion. And... <clears throat> It's interesting because both those movies actually have this thing they do right, which is they're very clearly building up to the very end of those movies. There's good build-up with a very definitive payoff going on there. And I was just saying something else, how it's like, I guess I couldn't tell if they were leading to anything like that. But definitely highly um, appreciating them. I've probably ton spoken tons of praise about Aliens before, because, um, yeah, if you want a horror movie, or if you want to see what actually the original... If you want to feel that original inspiration for the Xenomorph, Alien, the first movie, is definitely where it's at. Aliens is definitely good for kind of understanding where it went from a franchise going forward from there. Because that one was definitely the more action thing. And a lot of the video games are definitely highly inspired by Aliens more than Alien, simply because... You know, it lends itself better to action. Which is also why the best Alien game, which is Alien Isolation, is more highly inspired by the very first game. Or, sorry, the very first movie. 
But overall, you know, I've said all this stuff before. I really love Aliens. If there's anything about it that I would say is objectively better than Alien, it's that it is a objectively better story because it's it's got theming that it is designed to build up to and it builds up to it. It's a, it's not even a subjective does it build up to it. The subjectivity is whether or not that objective stuff uh, aligns with you or not, but it is objectively a story that is told to be built up to that thing at the very end. And in a way, Predator kind of is too. Uh, it isn't exactly, because it's also supposed to be a um, kind of a turning on the head, the 80s action um, idea. But when you watch Predator, you kind of understand why they really should have only made that one movie. Now, that said, if they didn't make Predator 2, then we wouldn't have had Bill Paxton in that movie, and that would be a shame. And maybe Predator 2 is kind of entertaining in its own kind of um, way, I suppose. Like, I don't feel like anything about Predator 2 necessarily shat on anything previously. I'm not sure if the later Predator stuff I could even really say it did. But I guess I'd probably have to watch it again. But if you liked Predator 1, I don't know that you'd necessarily like Predator 2. But if you were fascinated by the ideas behind Predator 1, maybe Predator 2 would be worth exploring. But as it is, it was kind of neat to watch, especially since, um, you know, this is my Twitch friend, and she plays a lot of Dead by Daylight, and this would have been her getting to see definitely one of the major inspirations for The Wraith. Now... Obviously, Dead by Daylight's Wraith character isn't exactly the Predator, but it is definitely clearly inspired by the same idea. It's like, oh, what if you're being hunted by this invisible thing? Well, Dead by Daylight has to balance that out in a certain way, so that's why he doesn't attack you while he's invisible or anything like that. He's not a space creature because that's not the kind of lore they're going for. Uh, things, Strange things like that. But, again, it comes down to, oh, yes, they're both about this shimmering shape trying to hunt you down. And if you needed any more hints, one of the race's perks is Predator. Um, but yeah, inspiration isn't a copy or anything like that. It's definitely the sort of thing where you're like, I can appreciate that. Especially since Wraith needs a bit more. But, okay, Dead by Daylight. Um, one of the reasons that's been a big important thing this past week is because today, you know, because it's past midnight right now, so it is Tuesday, November 22nd. This is supposed to be the release day of the next chapter in Dead by Daylight, which introduces the next killer and the next next survivor. <sighs> so, preparation going for that. For those of you not into Dead by Daylight, you might be asking, what's there to prepare for? Well, um, if I haven't mentioned before, Dead by Daylight is a game that doesn't necessarily demand, but if you really want to have ultimate freedom to do anything you want in the game, you need to grind like fucking mad. Like, And it's fortunate that the grinding of the game takes the form of actually playing the game and not like some, oh, well, instead of continuing the story of this RPG, we have to fight the enemies in this one area. No. You're going into trials, facing killers, everybody's doing their stuff. The killers are facing survivors sometimes, whatever. Everybody leaves with blood points to upgrade whatever they want to. You can take your killer blood points and spend it on survivors, your survivor blood points and spend them on killers. Okay, so um, one of the reasons this still would have been a thing if um, the, they hadn't changed the way um, perks were leveled up or unlocked or both. But they did change those, and it's fortunate because at this point, since I'm playing catch-up at the tail end of the idea of what that's supposed to super highly support, the idea is, you know, every killer has three perks, every perk has up to three levels, and every killer in the game can have their own copy of each of the levels of each of the perks. So, you know, you could unlock all the tier one perks and then go to a killer that you've never leveled up, and then he'll just have to level absolutely everything up. He'll get tier 1 in the blood web, tier 1, tier 1, oh, here's a tier 2 of one of the tier 1s, and then eventually they'll stop getting perks in the blood web because um, they'll finally have gotten all the perks and all the perks upgraded to tier 3. And if, you're, if you've never played and that's complicated, if that, as long as you understand that just sounds like it's a lot of stuff, you're right. So what they changed is, it used to be that for a killer you would unlock their perks so that other killers could find those perks in their blood webs. Now, 
you unlock levels of the perks when you prestige them. That's basically you reach level 50 and go back to the reset point. You know, it keeps track of how many times you do that reset, and we call that prestiging. But um, instead of you get the option to unlock them at specific levels for other killers, instead it is once you reach um, 50 and you prestige once, then a level 1 version gets automatically put onto absolutely all killers. And you could go to other killers and level them up and upgrade individually tier, tiers 2 and 3, and that's okay. But if you reach the point where you have all the killers, um, it's the survivors that applies there. If you have all the killers to prestige 3, that means all of their unlockable perks are at level 3 on every other killer. And then when a new killer comes out, all you have to do is focus on getting that one killer up to Prestige 3 to unlock his perks at the highest level for all the other killers. So it's something that doesn't help you a lot if you're focusing very narrowly. It helps some, but not a whole lot. But it, it doesn't remove enough flexibility such that um, you can't do that focusing. Right? It, it still has some flexibility there. There's just a little bit more, so you can't go, oh, I only want this person's perk, which used to show up at level 30. No, you have to go to 50 and prestige them once, and then their perks are unlocked. Or you get lucky and it shows up in the Shrine of Secrets, where you purchase it and then everybody has it. I know, complicated. But again, once you reach a point where everybody has almost everything, like if they have all the unlocked stuff, then when a new killer comes out, all you have to do is focus on that one killer. Okay. So, I'm at that point where all the survivors and all the killers are prestige 3 for me. So, all of their unlockable perks are unlocked at the max level on all survivors and all killers. So, when a new chapter comes out, I just have to level up the survivors and the killer. I said survivors, and sometimes they can be plural, like the Resident Evil had two survivors, Rebecca and Ada. Um, this one only comes up with one new killer and one... Uh, sorry, not new isn't the word I wanted. Uh, one... Um, It's a non-licensed, so it basically means it's a character that behavior themselves have created. So one non-licensed killer and one non-licensed survivor. So the idea is you want to work in advance to save up as much blood points so that as soon as it comes out, you can dump as many into that character as you want to try to get them to the right level so that they're not only completely playable, but their unique stuff is available on everybody else. You have to do that for killer, you have to do that for survivor. Um... <clears throat> Okay, you said, so just save up as much blood points. Well, the thing that makes that tricky is there's a blood point cap. You can't go above the cap, but it basically requires things that the game forces on you. So, like, when your ranks reset at the, um, I guess it's not rank reset, it's a great, when your grades reset on the 13th of every month, um, you get a bunch of blood points automatically given to your account. That is not limited by the blood point cap. So you can blow past it, and some people have done that, and they have crazy amounts of stuff because they have nothing better to do with their blood points. Fine for them, but I'm nowhere near being able to do that, and I don't know if I ever want to be able to do that. But as I get closer to that, um, you know, I'm, I'm still limited by that 2 million blood point limit. And to give you an idea, that might allow me to prestige um, a killer or survivor maybe twice. Maybe it was less than that. I don't remember. I'm going to have to find out. So the other thing you do is there's challenges. You have your daily challenges, and you can only have three of those at a time, so that doesn't net you a whole lot, but it does mean the past three days I've finished three daily challenges, and I'm just waiting until I spend blood points on the chapter before I then go in and res um, re um, get the blood points for those dailies and then spend those on the characters. So, you got those, but then when you got your tome challenges, which are challenges you select and complete, when you complete those challenges, you don't have to immediately redeem them, but you do generally want to progress through the tome, so you will select certain ones and leave others unselected. This is the first time I've ever had a metric shit ton of unclaimed blood points in there. And it's tricky because I'm going to continue claiming blood points. Um, like, I'm not going to necessarily save stuff up just because of this came out and I've done stuff and there will be a future one. Mostly because um, I still need blood points right now to make progress as it is. So hopefully yeah, that problem will be saved in the future. Because normally I've also saved my iridescent sh shards for um, redeeming perks that I already have from the Shrine of Secrets. Which if you already have them, then it's just free blood points. I say free. 
It's just blood points. But uh, there's a cosmetic I want that's only iridescent shards. Because um, it's, it's Bill from Left 4 Dead. He's a character in Dead by Daylight. And because he's owned by Valve, the way Valve does the licensing is they don't want people to spend real money on their licensed out Left 4 Dead characters. Which is neat, but of course it makes uh, somebody like me that has a fucking hole in my wallet um, unable to spend money to um, just get that. So I have to grind the cosmetics the slow, old-fashioned way. So that's Dead by Daylight. And as you can see, it's very complicated because of today. But to make things even more complicated, um, Pokemon um, Violet and Scarlet came out, of course. Ooh. And if y'all are curious, I went for Violet. I'm going to take a guess that I get the feeling that Violet's maybe a more common choice. Not that Scarlet isn't without its plus sides. Like, I think the uniform in Scarlet actually looks a lot better than the uniform in Violet. But, um, I don't know. And maybe that's just my peer group. At the same time, I kind of feel like um, Weed Cat and Cooler Daniel Duck. I'm, I'm trying to remember their... Uh, Quaxley is the duck's name. Um if they're maybe the more common starters, if maybe the fire starters are slightly less common. I don't know. Lots of weed cat users out there. With fucking weed cat. How can you not at least appreciate that? The answer is some people don't like its evolution. Um, but almost the same thing could be said about the Quaxley line. And I call it Cooler Daniel because it feels like we already had a water duck and that was um, Psyduck, who was also in this game. So you can have Daniel and then um, Quaxley, the Cooler Daniel. And I think Golduck also tended to be a little on the physical side, but I could be mistaken. Anyways, the point is, I chose Violet. I chose Weed Cat. And the reason for that is taking a look at kind of how all the starters evolve. You know, without going into big spoilers, you know, just from a strategic perspective, um, basically, grass and water are physical sweepers, whereas um, fire... They're kind of a, a tank, but they do a shit ton of special damage, and I don't know what you would call that, because that's not a special tank, because that actually means that they take special hits like crazy. don't remember that that stat is one that um, the fire starter actually has. But the point is, you know, if you take a look at those, I'm a bigger fan of playing through story mode using sweepers. And so that immediately eliminates red. And then taking a look at... Um, you know, water and grass. Grass actually learns a wider variety of stuff, in my opinion, whereas um, water looks like what you kind of want to get out of them limits you to three types of attacks, and I really like to try to get a rainbow of attacks. Especially since, you know, eventually I'll kind of have some overlap with the other Pokemon I choose, and that's kind of, in a, in a nutshell, you know what, I described the uniforms, but I can show you, like, that's the violet. It's not that that looks bad, but I really like that um, red and white contrast a lot better for some reason. Anyways, you know, it's it's all stuff, and there is something later on in the game that is the main reason I'm like, I'm going to choose violet because of that. And I don't want to say what that is, because that would be a spoiler, but, you know, it, it, overall, that might answer a lot of y'all questions. This is what I chose. That's the starter I chose. That's why I chose that starter because it appeals to my sweeper um, sensibilities. And if we go beyond that, what do I think about the game? It's actually been pretty good. Obviously, I mentioned that I'm having trouble, you know, it's engaging, it's entertaining. I really like the fact that it's definitely an open world Pokemon game. There are things that it are supposed to feel like rails that you're supposed to go in. Some of that is in the introductory area. But the truth of the matter is I felt like a fucking truant because I spent most of the time like, oh, I'm supposed to go to school? Nope, sorry, I got a ton of places I can walk. I'm walking there. I know I'll get a, you know, a car Pokemon later, but um, nope, right now I'm just, I'm, I'm walking around. I'm enjoying this. Go! Yeah! It's... It's been, it's been fun. It's just been pleasant, especially since I feel like I've been able to do some exploration for the sake of um, kind of exploring, kind of kind of sequence breaking, not too much. It's like I, I'm kind of wondering what a speedrun for this game is going to look like because there are these tricks that some people are finding. You know, I, I know I found one where you can um, get to places you're not supposed to be by abusing the way that a battle start mechanic works. So I was able to climb up things that I didn't have the ability to jump up yet. 
per se. But I don't know how much that's going to actually be used because just getting the things you need to do that might be convenient enough that it doesn't change things. I'm not really sure, especially since I haven't played far enough to kind of know what would even be considered the end of the game for this game. I need to put more time into it. I get the impression it sets up three completely separate story arcs. I'm just trying to think if I can describe them as something that's analogous to past games. And at least two of the things definitely are, but one of them I'm not sure is. And that makes me wonder, hmm... Part of the reasons I think it might not be as much is because I kind of suspect the late part of the game is designed to be like that. And I'm not there yet, but at the same time, I, I feel like I need to make sure I make pro progress in that degree, but at the same time, I don't need to try too hard. And unfortunately, you know, I'm designing a team based on, okay, now if only they had this, this, and this, then they'd be exactly what I want. And so it just has me kind of spending a lot of time spinning my wheels, so to speak. With that said, it's very interesting. The game um, has changed the obedience mechanism. So in historical po Pokemon game, um, as long as you were the original trainer for a Pokemon, it would um, behave, it would follow your orders no matter what. And this game is similar depending on the level that you met the Pokemon at. So previously, if the Pokemon was traded and the level was too high, oh, you're SOL. If you manage to get to an area where the Pokemon are a higher level, then your badges would allow you to catch. I guess they're supposed to be slightly harder to catch. But at the same time, they're also, um, they don't follow your orders until you get enough badges until you reach that point. Which is an interesting departure, but it does mean that old school style mechanism of, oh, you have them hatch eggs, trade them to another game, that game trades them up and then sends them back, that may still work. And I don't know how relevant that may still work actually is in this moment because I don't know, um... I, I obviously have both Violet and Scarlet, and I have three switches to choose from, but I don't know um, <clears throat> my plan exactly. I just know that I'm going to use Scarlet to at least get the fire starter and get a copy of that, but I'm not going to even worry about that until I find some Dittos, which I think I know where they are, but at this point I'm not sure if I'll know how to tell that I've definitely seen a Ditto, because I have some sneaky suspicion this game has done some really fucking sneaky stuff. I mean, if they haven't, then that's fine. But I just can't help but wonder. All right, but putting all that aside, you know, I'm just enjoying being in there. It's, it doesn't feel like I'm, oh yeah, I just did this story thing. Usually things that would be considered story marks in the previous Pokemon games are just things that's like, okay, I've put it off long enough. I have to do some of these because um, I'm, I need to get the things I need in order to build the team the way I want to build it. Simple as that. And... Yeah. It's been really neat. Okay. I've been babbling for a long time now. Is there anything else for me to discuss? Nothing else immediately comes to mind? All I know is, you know, we've got Thanksgiving this coming Thursday. I'm cooking stuff as usual. Um, I'm not going to try to record anything because I think every year I think, oh, I'll, I'll record something in case um, my subscribers want to see that. But at the end of the day, the big problem with recording th cooking of Thanksgiving dinner is related to timing. So when you're cooking a big meal with a bunch of different things, timing is very important because you kind of want to make sure things come out at the right order. So as an example, um, you can probably have your slow cooker end a little bit earlier compared to other stuff just because... Um, you know, sometimes you can let the stuff in the slow cooker stay in there and just maybe cool down and become just a little hot or a little warm, so somewhere in that range. Whereas um, if you cook biscuits, especially um, like um, the Pillsbury Flaky Layers biscuits in the oven, you want your meal to be closer to when those biscuits come out because they're better when they're fresh. Um, and so because you want to time things what it means for Thanksgiving dinner, which includes a lot of food and a lot of dishes, is it's just, I'm just too fucking busy. In fact, if there's one thing I have to always learn and remember, it's that gravy is a lot harder than I ever remember it ever having any business being. 
and I know that's a complicated amount of words to say, but yeah, again, that's just an example. I and, I, and since I'll be spending a lot of time stirring gravy, and maybe my dad will help me cutting of the turkey. I think he's always been iffy, and that's fine. He doesn't have to be the one to do it. Um, but it is one of those things where at least I know I can get the mashed potatoes out and kind of in the warming dish a little ahead of time. You don't want those to be sitting around for a very long time because, you know, actual mashed potatoes do tend to kind of get kind of eh over time. But it's all stuff. There's a lot of stuff. But um, if you ever wondered why don't I ever talk about Thanksgiving dinner, that would be why. It's because it's just too complicated. Not too complicated as in, like, y'all don't deserve to have the time, but too complicated as in, like, in the moment, I have to finish that dinner so that I have Thanksgiving dinner, my parents have Thanksgiving dinner. If we ever have any guests, they'll have Thanksgiving dinner. Um, so instead, it would be better if I just did, like, the individual components of it that build it up, although the turkey stuff is kind of hard. But then again, the way I cook the turkey is similar to the way I cook uh, chicken breasts, and I haven't done that in a while. That would be kind of nice. It's just that that's a too huge of a quantity, but I digress. Anyways, the point is, um, yeah, Thanksgiving's coming up. I'm actually kind of hungry for it for right now. Could just be because I haven't had enough to eat today. I did eat dinner, but now I'm not feeling full again. I should probably eat some pie. And it's not pumpkin pie. It's just some store-bought apple and cherry pie. But I kind of figured I'd do that because I'm going to treat myself to pumpkin pie, of course. That pumpkin pie is going to get cooked on Wednesday because you can... I, I think I've mentioned in my pumpkin pie video. It's I think there's two points in time when you should eat pumpkin pie. It's either after that couple of hours cooling down after you've taken them out of the oven because it tells you to either serve then or you serve after some chilled in the fridge. And in my opinion, chilled in the fridge is best and it's especially important that you have that you cook the pies the day before so that the day of they're the right amount of chill they're just delicious and they're good for the two days after you cook them they're still i actually correction they're great the first two days after you cook them. after that they're good which is to say that um yeah there's definitely a decline in the quality of mm, pumpkin pie but um it's still tasty so Lots of thoughts to keep on mind, to keep in mind, and I have to start paying attention to that stuff because I'm going to have to do dishes, keep on top of stuff. I can't sleep in on Thanksgiving Day. I'll have to actually wake up at a specific time. All that complicated stuff. But I have Pokemon between now and then. So hopefully y'all have been enjoying all these things or enjoying hearing me talk about these things these anime these video games all good things i forgot to talk about rick and morty season six the latest episode it was a funny episode um definitely not an episode you're supposed to take very seriously because it's super meta like super ridiculously meta but do a fun rick and morty kind of way it's entertaining very entertaining okay yeah i think that off officially wraps everything up Y'all, have a nice week.